this is the 40th lecture of our course on fundamentals of transport processes. Uh, welcome to you all. Last class we were discussing turbulent flows. Uh, as I said, turbulent flows originate when the base laminar flow goes unstable. Uh, the laminar flow profile is of course a solution of the equations of motion. For example, for simple channel or tube flows, it continues to be a solution of the equations of motion at all Reynolds numbers. However, as you go on increasing the Reynolds number, there comes a stage at which the laminar flow profile becomes unstable and spontaneously undergoes a transition to a turbulent flow. The turbulent flow is characterized by different characteristics. Uh, one is it is at high Reynolds numbers after the instability of the laminar flow. It is highly irregular with velocity fluctuations in all directions. Uh, it is three dimensional even though the mean flow may be two dimensional, you do have fluctuations at each location in the velocity in all three directions. The dissipation of energy and the stress due to these fluctuations is much larger than that due to the mean flow. And for this reason, turbulent flows have much higher stresses, uh, pressure differences, friction factors, as well as much higher energy dissipation rates than laminar flows where the dissipation occurs only due to molecular or the stress and the dissipation occur only due to molecular viscous transport. The transport and turbulence flows takes place due to eddies which are parcels of fluid uh, of different sizes which are moving in all directions. An integral part of this transport is the intensification of the vortex lines due to the stretching and bending of, I am sorry intensification of vorticity due to the stretching and bending of vortex lines. This happens only in three dimensions and therefore turbulent flows are inherently three dimensional. And uh, because uh, the, the dissipation ultimately occurs at the smallest scales, as I said the smallest scales are what are called the Kolmogorov scales. They are char characterized by a dependence only on the rate of dissipation of energy and the kinematic viscosity. So, you can get out dimensional uh, expressions for the smallest scales just based upon dimensional analysis. The Kolmogorov scales length and velocity are much smaller than the macroscopic scales and for this reason most of the kinetic energy is actually in the macroscopic scales because the velocities and lengths there are much larger. However, the strain rate in the smallest scales is much larger than the strain rate in the uh, large scales. Therefore, the dissipation of energy in the smaller scales is much larger than the dissipation in the large scale flow. And the dissipation of energy in the small scales basically balances the production of energy in the large scale flow. And that is why the energy production in the large scale flow is actually much larger than what you would expect just based upon dissipation at the large scales itself. The flow itself creates smaller and smaller scale eddies until you come to a length and a velocity scale at which the Reynolds number based upon the eddy length and velocity is order 1. Okay. So, that at that stage there is a balance between the production and dissipation of energy and it is at this scale that most of the energy is dissipated. So, we discussed the energy cascade in the last lecture of, of turbulent flows all the way from the macroscopic scales to the Kolmogorov scales. Uh, and uh, this picture was related to the models that we had discussed in the last lecture for turbulent flows, specifically the k epsilon model which is commonly used for turbulent flows. Okay. So, here in this lecture we will look at a concrete example of a turbulent flow and see how the modeling is done. Okay. So, the simplest example is actually the turbulent flow in a channel. So, you have a channel okay, of width 2 times h. I okay. will choose an x y coordinate system in which x is along the wall and y is perpendicular. Okay. So, y is equal to 0 is the bottom surface, y is equal to h is the mid plane and y is equal to 2 h is the top surface. And we have a turbulent velocity flow here. 
So, the velocity profile looks something like this. It is much flatter than the laminar velocity profile which I would have had for a laminar flow which would be a parabolic profile at that same Reynolds number. Okay. So, this mean velocity profile is what I called u of y okay. and of course, there are turbulent velocity fluctuations. Okay. So, how do I model the, the, the flow in this turbulent uh, channel? Okay. First thing to note, I can solve the problem only from y is equal to 0 to y is equal to h because it is symmetric about that center plane. Okay. So, at y is equal to h, you require from just from uh, uh, symmetry that at y is equal to h, du by dy has got to be equal to 0, whereas the no slip condition requires that capital U has to be equal to 0 at the bottom surface. Important to note, no slip condition requires that both the mean and the fluctuating velocity are both equal to 0 at the bottom surface. That means that capital U, which is the flow in the x direction, the mean velocity is equal to 0. The fluctuations are also equal to 0, u x prime, u y prime and u z prime are all equal to 0 at this bottom surface. Similarly, at the top at, at the mid plane, the, the, the divergence I am sorry the, 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 the slope of the mean velocity profile is equal to 0. In addition, you cannot have a Reynolds stress, a Reynolds shear stress u x prime, u y prime. We will come back to that a little later. So, I can write down the momentum conservation equations in the x and y directions okay, for the mean flow. These momentum conservation equations will of course contain the Reynolds stress terms. Okay. I assume this is a steady flow. So, there is nothing that is changing along the x direction apart from the pressure which of course is required to drive the flow. Okay. So, there is nothing changing along the x direction apart from the pressure which is required to drive the flow. Okay. So, the momentum conservation equation okay, for the mean velocity profile can be written as uh, uj partial ui by partial xj is equal to minus 1 over rho partial p by partial xi okay, minus plus the, the viscosity times minus rho times u i prime u j prime. Okay. So, that is the equation momentum conservation equation where i is the direction of the momentum and j is the repeater index. Okay. So, now if I write this equation for the x momentum equation, okay, if I write this for the x momentum equation, I will get u x partial u x by partial x I should make a correction here this this pressure here is the mean pressure. If you recall this is the mean pressure because I have averaged the entire momentum conservation equation over time okay. Okay. plus mu partial square u x by partial x square and this uh, once again there is a mistake here. Then I have minus partial by partial x of rho u x prime square minus partial by partial y of okay. So, that is the momentum conservation equation and now we can apply our condition that there is no variation in the x direction apart from the pressure okay. and the component of the velocity u y is identically equal to 0 because the mean flow is only in the x direction. Okay. So, this there is no variation in the x direction, so that is 0. Capital U y is equal to 0 because there is no mean velocity perpendicular to the uh, main flow. Okay. There is a pressure gradient of course in the x direction, okay. this should be a kinematic viscosity. Okay. 
because I divided through it by the density, so that should be a kinematic viscosity. Partial square ux by partial y x square is equal to 0 because there is no variation in the x direction. Similarly, there is no variation of the fluctuations as well in the x direction because this is a fully developed flow. So, you would express, expect no variations in the root mean square of the fluctuating velocities in the x direction as well. So, therefore, this is also equal to 0. Okay. And my momentum conservation equation just reduces to density here because I divided throughout by the density okay. plus nu partial square u by partial y square minus partial by partial y of ux prime ui prime. This is equal to 0. So, this is the momentum conservation equation for this channel in the x direction. Okay. For the y direction, I just substitute i is equal to y. Okay. I just substitute i is equal to y in my momentum conservation equation and I will get ux partial uy by partial x minus 1 by rho partial p by partial y plus And then I get that fluctuating term that is minus partial by partial x of ux uy prime I get this additional term here which is partial by partial x j of uy prime uj prime. So, it is partial by partial x of ux prime uy prime and partial by partial y of uy prime square. Once again, simplifications can be made in this equation. Okay. First thing u y is identically equal to 0, capital U y is equal to 0 because there is no mean velocity in the y direction. Therefore, the entire left hand side goes to 0. The viscous term goes to 0 on the right hand side, capital U y is equal to 0. And since the flow is fully developed, there is no variation in the x direction partial by partial x of u x prime u y prime this is equal to 0. Okay. Therefore, my momentum conservation equation in the y direction reduces to minus 1 by rho partial p by partial y minus partial by partial y of u y prime square is equal to 0. So, that is the y momentum conservation equation and as I wrote the x momentum conservation equation as minus 1 by rho partial p by partial x plus nu this is equal to 0. The y momentum conservation equation when we did it for laminar flows, we found that partial p by partial y was equal to 0. Okay, for a laminar velocity profile, we found that partial p by partial y was equal to 0. That is because u y itself was 0. There was no viscous diffusion of y momentum because uh, the velocity u y was equal to 0. Therefore, there was nothing to balance the pressure term. In this particular case, there is transport of momentum due to the velocity fluctuations. And for that reason, the pressure gradient is basically balancing the transport of momentum due to the fluctuating velocity in the y direction. In the laminar flow, there is no fluctuating velocity, so we just get partial p by partial y is equal to 0. The y momentum equation can be integrated once with respect to y because both terms have a derivative with respect to y. Okay, so, the y momentum equation can be integrated once with respect to y. Okay. I can write this as p by rho plus half u y is equal to some constant p naught by rho. Okay. What is p naught? p naught is the pressure at the location where u y prime is equal to 0 because I have p by rho plus half u prime y prime square is equal to p naught by rho. 
P naught by rho is the constant of integration. It is the value of the pressure at which uh, at the location where u i prime is equal to 0. What is the location at which u i prime is equal to 0? That is the wall of course. Okay. At y is equal to 0, we have a solid wall. The no slip condition that means that both all components of the velocity both mean and fluctuating have to be equal to 0. Therefore, P naught is the wall pressure. Okay. P naught is the wall pressure, the pressure at the wall. Okay. The pressure at the location where u i prime, the velocity u i prime is equal to 0. Further, if we take the derivative of this entire equation with respect to x, okay, if we take the derivative of this entire equation with respect to x, we get 1 by rho partial p by partial x plus partial by partial x of half u i prime square is equal to 1 by rho partial p naught by partial x. Partial p naught by partial x. You have a steady fully developed flow that means that there is no downstream variation of u i prime square. Okay. There is no downstream variation of u i prime square. Therefore, this term is equal to 0 okay. which means that partial p by partial x is equal to partial p naught by partial x. Note that the pressure p itself was the mean pressure. It was a function of both x and y. Okay. p naught is a constant of integration. I had an equation which has a derivative of with respect to y in it. I integrated that once to get the value of p naught. Therefore, p naught is defined only at the wall. It is not a function of y. It is only a function of x is the wall pressure at a given location x. Okay. Okay. So now, second point that means that since partial p by partial x is equal to partial p naught by partial x, I can substitute for partial p naught by partial x here. I can substitute for partial p naught by partial x here. Partial p naught by partial x is now not a function of y. It is not a function of the cross stream distance in the channel since it is the wall pressure itself. So, my x momentum conservation be equation becomes minus 1 by rho partial p naught by partial x plus nu partial square u x by partial y square okay, minus partial by partial y of u x prime u y prime is equal to 0. Since p naught is not a function of x, I can integrate this one with respect to y. I can integrate this once with respect to y. Okay. If I integrate this once with respect to y, I will get minus y by rho partial p naught by partial x plus nu partial u x by partial y minus partial by partial, I am sorry, minus okay, plus a constant of integration plus a constant of integration is equal to 0. That constant of integration I will write it as minus u star square. Okay. That is the constant of integration in the equation. Okay. Minus u star square is equal to 0. Okay. What does that constant of integration represent? Okay. Easiest is to take the value of this equation of this equation at y is equal to 0. At y is equal to 0, of course, I have minus y by rho partial p naught by partial x that is equal to 0. Okay. So, I will have plus nu partial u x by partial y. Okay. Fluctuating velocities are 0 at the wall, therefore, u x prime u y prime is equal to 0. This minus u star square is equal to 0, okay. which implies that if I just multiply throughout by density, I get rho u star square is equal to mu times partial u x by partial y. This is equal to the mean shear stress at the wall. Okay. This is equal to the mean shear stress at the wall. Okay. 
So, that is the physical interpretation of this velocity u star square. It is a physical interpretation of this velocity u star square. Rho u star square is the shear stress at the wall. For that reason, u star is often called as the friction velocity. It is a velocity scale that is defined not based upon the mean velocity itself, but rather from the stress from the requirement that rho u star square is equal to the wall shear stress. Okay. The other thing we can do is to write down this equation, okay, take the value of the same equation. this equation at y is equal to h. As you recall y is equal to h is the center of the channel. And have the velocity profile that looks something like this. Let me write it out a little better for you. The velocity is of course symmetric about the center of this channel y is equal to h. Okay. That means that at y is equal to h, I require that the velocity gradient, the mean velocity gradient has to be equal to 0 because the mean velocity has to go through a maximum at y is equal to h. So at this particular location, the mean velocity itself, the gradient of the mean velocity is equal to 0, the velocity goes through a maximum. So therefore, in my equation at uh, y is equal to h, I have minus h by rho partial p naught by partial x plus nu partial ux by partial y minus ux prime ui prime minus u star square is equal to 0. Okay. At y is equal to h, the velocity gradient is equal to 0. In addition, symmetry requires that ux prime ui prime is equal to 0. Okay because you require that at y is equal to h itself, the configuration is perfectly symmetric. So if I have a parcel of fluid moving with a fluctuating velocity plus ux prime, at this location alone, it should have equal probability of having a velocity in the plus ui direction or minus ui direction. Because at this plane, at this symmetry plane, the, the velocity has to be symmetric with respect to plus and minus y, y directions. Therefore, u x prime u y prime has to be equal to 0. For a given velocity in the x direction, there should be equal probability of the parcel of fluid moving either in the plus y direction or in the minus y direction at this symmetry plane alone. Okay. So, this also becomes equal to 0. Okay. So, this gives me another expression for u star and that is that u star square is equal to minus h by rho dp dx okay. or alternatively the wall shear stress, the, the wall pressure gradient is related as minus rho by h u star square. Okay. Therefore, substituting for this for the pressure gradient from this expression in terms of the friction velocity, okay, I substitute for the pressure gradient in my momentum conservation equation which was here. Okay. This was the reduced momentum conservation equation that I had. Based upon the condition at y is equal to h, I had also uh, obtained an uh, a relationship between u star and the pressure gradient. Substituting that in, okay, you get an equation for the x momentum conservation equation which goes as plus nu. is equal to u star square into 1 minus y by h. Okay. So, this is the expression that I get where u star was equal to the rho u star square was equal to the wall shear stress. Okay. So, this is my final expression for the velocity profile. As you can see, there is a fluctuating momentum transfer and there is a mean momentum transfer. The sum of these two is equal to minus u star square into 1 minus y by h we can scale this equation. The natural length scale for the y coordinate is h 
Okay. The length scale, the, 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 okay. the half width of the channel h is the natural length scale for the y coordinate. What about for the fluctuating velocity? You have a natural scale here that is u star. Okay. There is a natural scale for the fluctuating velocity. Okay. So, if I scale it this way, if I scale the, the length scale by h and the fluctuating velocity by u star, the dimensionless equation, I will define y star is equal to y by h. The dimensionless equation becomes minus u x prime u y prime by u star square plus nu. Okay. Okay. Now, I have to scale u x by u star, okay. I, do it, I have to divide throughout by u star square. So, I get nu by u star square partial u x by h times partial y star, because I defined y star is equal to y by h. So, I get a factor of h coming out okay, is equal to 1 minus y star. Okay. Rearranging these terms a little bit, okay, what I will get is minus u x prime u y prime by u star. plus nu by u star h partial by partial y star of u x by u star is equal to 1 minus y star. Nu by u star h is a Reynolds number based upon the friction velocity. Okay, because u star is the friction velocity, h is the length scale, the half width of the channel. So, by nu by u star h is the length scale based upon the, uh, nu by u star h is an inverse of a Reynolds number based upon the friction velocity. Okay. So, if I express it this in terms of that Reynolds number, I will get minus u x prime u y prime by u star square plus r e star inverse. equal to 1 minus y star. Clearly, in the limit of high Reynolds number, you would expect the Reynolds number based upon the friction velocity also to be large. That means that this term is small compared to this term here. Okay. Basically, it reiterates what we said for a turbulent flow. The transport of momentum due to the Reynolds stress due to the fluctuating velocity is much larger than the transport of momentum due to the mean velocity gradient. Okay. So, in this case, in the center of the channel, there is a balance between the fluctuating velocity, uh, transport of momentum due to the fluctuating velocity and the pressure gradient. After all, it is the pressure gradient that actually gave us this u star square term, okay, the wall pressure gradient. Okay. So, this seems to indicate that the mean velocity, the, the, the transport of energy due to the mean velocity is not important. Okay. Uh, however, at the wall itself, fluctuating velocities have to go to 0 and transport very close to the wall ultimately has to happen due to the viscous diffusion, the diffusion of momentum due to the mean flow because the fluctuating velocities themselves have to go to 0. However, the mean velocity gradient will still be there. Even though the fluctuating velocities go to 0, u x prime and u i prime go to 0, but however, there will be a mean velocity gradient at the wall and the stress due to that. That uh, mean velocity gradient is, uh, uh, is important very close to the wall as the fluctuating velocities go to 0. So, clearly there has to be a region very close to the wall where the mean velocity gradient is important and the fluctuating velocities go to 0. What is the length scale appropriate for that? Clearly that length scale is not the length scale h because that is a channel half width and the Reynolds number based upon that is large. So, the length scale that you get can depend only upon the friction velocity, which basically is, is a measure of the shear stress at the wall and the kinematic viscosity. Okay. And from the friction velocity and the kinematic viscosity, you can get only one length scale that is nu by u star, because the kinematic viscosity has dimensions of length square per time, friction velocity has dimensions of length per time and based upon that you can get only one length scale. 
by balancing out the kinematic viscosity uh, by taking the ratio of the kinematic viscosity and the friction velocity. So, that is the viscous length scale near the wall. You would expect over that length scale the fluctuating velocities have to go to 0 because they have to be identically 0 at the wall. Okay. There will still be a mean velocity gradient and a shear stress due to that and in that region the mean velocity gradient uh, the, the shear stress due to the mean velocity gradient has to balance the pressure gradient. Okay. So, let us see what you get for that region. Okay. Therefore, I have to rescale my y coordinate as y plus okay. it is called the inner uh, the viscous coordinate is equal to y u star y u. Okay. So, there is a scaled velocity the scaled y coordinate y divided by nu by u star. So, if I define y plus in this way okay, and I express it in once again in my equation of motion, okay, what I will get is minus u x u y prime by u star square plus okay. this is a kinematic viscosity right, divided by this is expressed explicitly okay. is equal to 1 minus y by h okay. and I express therefore, y is equal to nu y plus by u star. With this you will get minus u x prime u y prime by u star square plus okay. this will just give me partial of u x by u star by partial y plus okay. it is equal to 1 minus nu by u star h y plus. expressing in terms of the velocity y plus. Okay. And you can easily see that this can be written as one minus R e star inverse y plus. Since I have a factor of R e star inverse here, that means that in the limit of high Reynolds number, this goes to 0 and the right hand side just becomes 1. So, in this wall viscous sublayer okay, of thickness y plus, uh, I am sorry, nu by u star, okay, in this wall viscous sublayer of thickness y plus by nu star, there is a balance between the mean uh, viscous stress and the fluctuating Reynolds stresses. So, we have two regions in the flow, the central region where of course, the mean viscous transport, the, uh, the viscous transport due to the mean flow is much smaller than the momentum transport due to fluctuations. However, as you come close to the wall, fluctuations have to go to 0 because they are identically 0 at the wall. The velocity gradient is still there and therefore, you could have a balance between the viscous stresses due to the mean flow and the Reynolds stresses. Okay. So, you have two equations in two regions one is where y is comparable to h the thickness of the uh, the half width of the channel the other is in the viscous sublayer where y is comparable to nu by u star the ratio of these two length scales is of course 1 over the reynolds number okay so the viscous sublayer is re star inverse smaller than the channel half width h okay. so now how do we can we say something about the actual velocity profiles in these two regions okay, in the outer region and in the wall region. Okay. So, in the, in, the, in the center of the channel okay, in the center of the channel okay, let me call it the core of the channel okay, that is when the distance from the wall becomes large compared to the viscous sublayer thickness. Okay. 
The only relevant length scale for the mean velocity profile should be the length scale h itself. Okay. The only length scale for the mean velocity profile should be the length scale h itself. Okay. That means that I should be able to write, okay, I should be able to write the velocity gradient. Okay. If the only length scale is h itself, the friction velocity is still there because that determines the mean shear stress and the pressure gradient at the center. Okay. So, the, both the pressure gradient at the center and the wall shear stress are both equal to the friction velocity. Okay. Uh, so, if, if we write the pressure gradient, uh, the gradient of the mean velocity, just based upon dimensional analysis, analysis, this has to be of the form u star by h, since these are the relevant length and the velocity scales, times some dimensionless functions okay, d f by d y star, okay, where this f is some dimensionless function of y star. Okay, f is a function of y star. Okay. And if I integrate this from the center of the channel to any location y, okay, if I integrate the, this from the center of the channel to any location y, okay, because I am looking at the velocity profile in the core of the channel. Okay. I would like to go towards the wall of course, but there the law is different as I will just show you because the length scale, relevant length scale is in nu by u star. So, I have to integrate from some location which is within the domain for which this velocity is written down and that is the center of the channel. Okay. So, therefore, u x minus u x naught, okay, which is the velocity profile, which is the value of the velocity at the center of the channel. Let me just write this, this velocity is equal to u naught, okay. it is a constant. Okay. This uh, has got to be uh, divided by this is just equal to f of y star. Okay, this is the scaled velocity. This is the law that applies in the core of the channel. Okay. What about as you go close to the wall? As you approach the wall, the relevant length scale is nu by u star. Okay, as you approach the wall, the relevant length scale is nu by u star. Okay. That means that very close to the wall, I should have dux by dy is equal to u star by nu by u star d of f of y plus. Okay, because that is the only length scale where f is some dimensionless function of y. Okay. Okay. So is equal to u star square by nu d f by d y plus. Okay. U star square by nu d f by d y plus. Okay. So, therefore, I have these two laws for the velocities in these two different regions. Okay. This is at the wall, okay. this is in the wall layer. So, this is for y, y goes as h okay, in the core of the channel when y is proportional to h itself. This is in the wall layer where y goes as nu by u star. Okay. So, I have one particular law in the core of the channel okay, when the distance from the wall is large compared to the, the viscous sub layer thickness. And I have another one very close to the viscous sub layer. Okay. So, this I can integrate once to get the velocity u x is equal to uh, u stars uh, u x by, by u star is equal to f of y plus. Okay. I just integrate this once and I will get u x by u star is equal to f of y plus. Okay. So, I have these two laws, one valid in the core of the flow where the turbulent fluctuations are large compared to the viscous momentum diffusion of stress, the other in the wall region where both the viscous diffusion, uh, viscous stress and the Reynolds stresses are comparable. Now, this, okay, so let us let's, uh, let's divide the domain into three regions. Okay. One is
here I have y goes as nu by u star. Okay. I have this region here where y goes as h. Okay. Obviously, these are two approximations for the velocity profile in two different regions. Okay. These are two approximations for the velocity profile in two different regions. These two approximations have to converge to the same value in the intermediate region where y is large compared to nu by u star and y is small compared to h. Okay. In this intermediate region, both of these velocities have to merge. Okay. Of course, I can obtain an agreement for the mean velocity itself by just adjusting the value of the velocity at the center. Okay. So, the mean velocity itself agreement can be obtained if you shift the center line velocity. Okay. However, you require that the velocity gradient, okay, the gradient in the velocity in both cases have to converge to the same value. Okay. So, you have one law for y going as h, another law for y going as nu by u star. Okay. In the intermediate region, okay, that is nu by u star, okay, much smaller than y, much smaller than h. Okay. What does it mean nu by u star much smaller than y, much smaller than h? Since y is much smaller than h, y star which is equal to y by h is much smaller than 1. Okay. Since y is much larger than nu by u star, I have y plus which is equal to y by u star by nu is much greater than 1. So, as I take the limits of y star small compared to 1 and y plus large compared to 1, okay, the ratio of course, you know y, y star by y plus will be equal to Reynolds number. Okay. The ratio is the Reynolds number, y star by y plus uh, is equal to the Reynolds number. Okay. Therefore, as I simultaneously take okay, y star becoming small compared to 1, okay, should, this is as I simultaneously take y star becoming small compared to 1 and y plus becoming large compared to 1, the two laws for the two velocities in these two regions have to be identical. Okay. The two laws for these two the velocities have to be identical. As I said the absolute value of the velocity itself contains u naught in it which still has to be determined. Okay. So, that is still unknown. However, the velocity gradients do not contain any constants. Okay. The velocity gradients themselves do not contain any constants. Therefore, you require that the, in this intermediate region, the velocity gradients, by, whether you approach the outer region from the wall layer or you approach the wall from the outer region, these two velocity gradients have to be the same. Okay. So, in this intermediate regime, you require that dux by dy which is equal to u star by h d f by d y star. Okay. This has to be equal to u star square by nu d a small f by d y plus u star square by nu d small f by d y plus. Okay. I can cancel out one u star here okay, and multiply both sides of the equation by y. Okay. If you multiply both sides of the equation by y, what you get is that y star d f by d y star is equal to y plus d f by d y plus. Okay. This has to be true in the limit as y plus goes to infinity and y star goes to 0 simultaneously for any value of the Reynolds number. Okay. This has to be true for as y plus goes to infinity and y star goes to 0 simultaneously for any value of the Reynolds number. Okay. If I keep h a constant and change the Reynolds number, I will change the right hand side of the equation, but not the left hand side. Okay. On the other hand, if I keep the Reynolds number, the friction Reynolds number a constant and change h, I will change the left hand side, but not the right hand side. The only way that this equality can continue to be satisfied in all of these cases is if both of these are equal to constants. 
that constant is traditionally written as 1 over kappa. So, we will follow that notation here. That means that these two are equal to constants 1 over kappa. Okay. So, these equations can be solved. Okay. So, the solution for f basically is f is equal to 1 by k log of y star plus a constant b okay. and f of y plus is equal to 1 over k log of y plus plus a constant a. So, just this matching condition that both the velocity profiles have to go to a common value in an intermediate region in between the uh, outer core flow where the Reynolds stresses are dominant and the viscous sublayer where the Reynolds stresses are balanced by the viscous stresses. Just that requirement alone tells me that both of the velocity profiles in both of these regions had to be given by a logarithmic profile okay, in this intermediate region. Okay. Of course, in the viscous sublayer, there has to be a departure from this because at y plus is equal to 0, the velocity has to go to 0. Okay. But in the intermediate region, as you approach the outer flow from the wall, you should get a logarithmic velocity profile which matches with the velocity profile that you get as you approach the wall from the core of the flow. Beyond this, one cannot uh, obtain any further information okay, just from analysis alone. One has to go to experiments to see what these constants are, 1 over kappa a and b. Okay. As I told you, this f is equal to u minus u naught by h and this is equal to u x by h. So, this from these two equations, okay, from these two equations we can infer, I am sorry, this u x by u star. We can relate the mean velocity to these constants, okay, that is we get uh, u naught by u star the mean velocity at the center of the channel divided by the friction velocity is equal to 1 over kappa log of R e star okay, plus a minus b. Okay. So, that gives us a relation between the mean velocity and the friction velocity. Okay. Beyond this one cannot obtain information just from analysis alone, one has to go and fit the data from experimental results and a lot of data from experimental results which have been fitted give the values of kappa is equal to 0 0.4 which implies that 1 over kappa is equal to 2.5, okay. a is equal to 5 and b is equal to 1. Okay. So, these are called the, the log loss for the wall, okay, the logarithmic loss for the velocity profile in the wall layer and in the intermediate layer okay, in between the uh, the viscous sublayer and the bulk of the flow. Okay. And on this basis, you find that u naught by u star plus 0 0.6, okay. and f is equal to 2.5 log of y star plus 1. I am sorry, a is equal to 5 and b is equal to 1 b is equal to minus 1 actually okay. and uh, minus 1. f is equal to 2.5 log of y plus plus 5. So, these are the constants that are obtained on the basis of analysis of a large amount of data. Okay. So, this tells uh, gives us some indication of how these turbulent flows can be modeled. Okay. Basically, we have written down the equations for the mean uh, momentum in the x and y directions including the Reynolds stress terms and we use some fairly simple considerations. There was no variation in the x direction apart from the pressure which can have a non-zero pressure gradient. Okay. and symmetry conditions for both the mean and the fluctuating velocities. And then there was one important additional ingredient that we used and that was that whatever velocity profile that is there in the core of the channel 
depends only upon that length scale h, right. It does not depend upon the length scale relevant very close to the wall. The velocity profile very close to the wall depends only upon the length scale nu by u star, which is the viscous sublayer thickness, okay, because the length scale relevant for the entire uh, channel is not relevant for the flow very close to the wall. Okay. So, we wrote down loss just based upon dimensional analysis for those two, for the mean velocity variation in those two regions. And then the requirement that the velocity gradients have to match in this intermediate region between the, the, the viscous sublayer and the fully developed turbulent flow on top gave us a form for the velocity profile. It told us the velocity profile just based upon this similarity argument has to be logarithmic in that intermediate region. It also gave us relations between that logarithmic velocity profile and the mean velocity at the center of the channel. So, using rather simple considerations, we were able to obtain a specific form for the velocity law, the logarithmic velocity law okay, in the intermediate region. Of course, that law had constants which then had to be fitted, but the very fact that in experiments you find the same logarithmic velocity law implies that these are very powerful techniques. Okay. Simple dimension analysis along with matched asymptotic expansions, that is matching of the velocity profile in two different layers. We don't, we, uh, uh, you, uh, the velocity in the outer core is of course known only to within one unknown constant which is the velocity at the center. The velocity in the inner region, the constant there is just the wall velocity. However, the velocity gradients in the intermediate region, if you come from towards the wall from above or if you go towards the uh, turbulent core from below, these two gradients have to be identically the same. That gave us a form for the velocity profile. So, in that sense, it is a very powerful argument and of course, the, equa the, the constants in that, uh, in that in those uh, 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 velocity profiles have to be obtained from experiments, but nevertheless, you do find that those velocity profiles are actually obeyed in experiments. So, this has given you some uh, basic idea of how turbulence modeling is done in these inhomogeneous flows. In the previous lecture, we considered just a homogeneous turbulent flow itself without uh, uh, reference to any spatial variations, okay. But in this case, we actually considered the flow in a channel and seen how we can model the velocity fluctuations that are taking place across the channel. Okay. So, this completes all the discussion that I have on turbulent flows, okay. Uh, we started our discussion on uh, fundamentals of transport processes 2 by basically starting uh, uh, focusing on deriving the conservation equations, the Navier-Stokes mass and momentum equations. We also derived the equation for the energy and the angular momentum. These were done using the fundamentals of vector calculus that we developed, the gradient divergence and the curl. And once we derived those equations, we found that the stress tensor has to be symmetric in order to satisfy the angular momentum conservation equation. And just from simple considerations of, of, of symmetry, and the dependence of the stress on the rate of deformation. Okay. We decompose the, the flow fields into three different parts, radial expansion or compression, uh, rotation and extensional strain corresponding to the isotropic, anti-symmetric and symmetric traceless parts of the rate of deformation tensor. And we said that the viscous, the, the viscous stress should depend only upon the symmetric traceless part because the rotation cannot affect the, uh, cannot generate internal stresses and the radial part is 0 for an incompressible flow. On that basis, we had got the uh, uh, Navier-Stokes mass and momentum conservation equations for an incompressible fluid. The mass conservation equation basically said that the divergence of the velocity is equal to 0 everywhere. So, that the radial component of the radial deformation tensor is equal to 0. Then we had the momentum conservation equation. The rest of the course was dedicated to different ways of solving these equations. The equation themselves have a structure similar to those for um, uh, energy and mass transport. They contain convective and diffusive terms, inertial and viscous terms. The only addition is the pressure that is required to enforce incompressibility because we now have one mass conservation equation, three momentum conservation equations because the scale, it's, it's a vector and therefore, you need four variables three components of the velocity and one pressure. The ratio of the inertial and the viscous terms is the Reynolds number. 
and we used that to advantage. We looked at the limit of low Reynolds number where the viscous terms are dominant and the solution of these equations basically reduced to solution of Laplace equations for the pressure and the homogeneous velocity. And we looked at various ways to solve these, you know, the interpretation of, of vector harmonics by just taking gradients of the fundamental source solution, okay, gave us ways to solve for the velocity fields around a sphere, for the dipole due to uh, um, uh, a rotation of the sphere or due to the straining. We also looked at surfaces close to each other, uh, the lubrication problem, how do we take advantage of the fact that large amount of fluid has to flow through a thin gap thereby generating large stresses in order to solve the problem and get analytical solution which told us that the force increases as 1 over the distance between surfaces. Then we went on to potential flows. Once again, in that case, inviscid, irrotational, no viscosity, vorticity is equal to 0. However, you do get non-trivial solutions because you have a pressure there. Okay. In um, mass and energy conservation equations, we do not have a pressure, so we do not get um, uh, non-trivial solutions. In this case, you have a pressure. Because it is irrotational, the velocity can be expressed as the gradient of a potential. The momentum conservation equation reduces to one scalar equation for the pressure, the Bernoulli equation. We looked at different ways to solve problems both in, two, in three dimensions using our vector spherical harmonics as well as in two dimensions using the method of complex variables. Important results, the force on an object in three dimensions is 0 if it is at steady flow, if it is moving with a constant velocity. So, velocity is varying, it goes as the half the added mass times the acceleration. In three dimensions, you could have a force, a lift force even uh, uh, for a steady flow provided there is a net circulation. Then we looked at modular theory, how does one incorporate the effect of of viscous stresses very close to surfaces. You have got an important result there and that is that when you have a decelerating boundary layer, uh, the pressure is decreasing, uh, the velocity is decreasing as a function of distance. Boundary layer separation takes place behind bluff bodies and the potential flow solutions are no longer valid there. Okay. However, if you have an accelerating flow, you have a confined boundary layer. And therefore, one can talk of a, an outer region where the potential flow is valid and a thin boundary layer near the surface because it is r e power minus half where viscous effects have to be taken into account. We looked at the dynamics of vorticity which happens after this boundary layer separation or if, if vorticity is generated somewhere within the flow. Okay. Vorticity cannot be produced uh, within the flow, it can be dissipated due to viscous effects and it can also in general be convected okay, and intensified due to the stretching or bending of vortex lines. And finally, we looked at turbulent flow in the past few lectures. I explained to you the spectrum of turbulence, the energy cascade, why eddies are created of many uh, of various sizes, the dissipation of energy at the smallest scales. And uh, finally, I also explained to you how one would go about modeling a turbulent flow of practical interest, in this particular case, the flow in a channel. So that briefly summarizes all the, uh, all the work that we have done in this particular course. I hope you found it useful and uh, I wish you all the best.